So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Internet of Things State of the Union here in the Mirage at reInvent 2016. And I know it's a little cold, and it took you quite a while to migrate from the different casinos, but I hope it's worth the walk. Uh, my name is Dirk Didaskalu, and I'm the Vice President of the Internet of Things, or if I would use the terminology of my CEO, I'm the Vice President of the Buzzword. Because why he's referring to Internet of Things as a buzzword, he's saying is, Talking about the future, it goes in line with the similar buzzwords of the cloud, big data, and now it's the Internet of Things. And I thought, what better way then to start this presentation and try to define what do we actually mean by the Internet of Things? So to put us all on the same ground of what the buzzword means for us here at AWS. And it's on purpose that I put um, the S, the plurality of things, here in emphasis, because when you look at what our dear friends, the analysts, typically say when we talk about the Internet of Things, then you see this, what I call the canonical analyst graph about IoT, because it speaks about the explosion of things, going from what? 10 billion to 20 billion, 30 billion, 50 billion, I've seen up to 200 billion devices. The so saying is, that's a lot of things. And as you've heard Andy in his keynote saying is that that is potentially the new infrastructure that you have on premise compared to the old data centers. But there's another way um, if you want to define something. I mean, nowadays, you simply look it up. Now, where do you go? Wikipedia. Wikipedia knows everything. So let's see what Wikipedia actually says about the Internet of Things. And if I'm not completely wrong, they say something like, the Internet of Things is the network of physical objects which embedded with electronics, sensors, software, and connectivity allow these physical things to collect and exchange data. I mean, that's technically not wrong. But I'm pretty sure if you would ask somebody today, what is the internet? Very few would answer with the Wikipedia definition of, oh, the internet's that the global system of interconnected compute networks um, running the TCP IP protocol. Most people most likely would say, oh, the internet, yeah, that, that's a means for me to access a lot of information resources, to have solutions, services, or applications. So it's rather a value approach. And I think that's what we would like to do at AWS, and that's what we typically do with our customers. We try to start with a value approach, and almost all discussions that we have with our customers start with one simple question, and saying is, okay, and we discuss, what if you knew the state of everything? And what if you could reason on top of that knowledge or that data? What problems would you solve? And what better way to describe the real value of IoT as the collective answer to this question? The only problem with that question is there are two tiny conditions, and they are very hard to meet. Knowing the state of everything and being able to reason on top of that. And if you like, we made it our goal to make sure that these two conditions are met. And in order to understand what we will need to take and do for that, let's have a look at what I call the three pillars or the three constituents of IoT. And of course, they are the things. To the left side, the things that sense and act. And you would argue, okay, what's new about this? I mean, things, the moment there was connectivity, it's since almost 100 of years, we call this once machine-to-machine -machine communication. Why the fuzz about it? And of course, I think why we talk about this explosion is that the advent of the mobile revolution where I grew up in, which was my past professionally as well, gave us what we call nowadays the system on chips. Small little tiny integrated objects which have connectivity, compute, and memory for less than a dollar. So nowadays it's actually economically feasible to connect literally everything or your chair on which you are sitting. So that's why we have this explosion that the analysts forecast. And then there's the other thing which we at AWS feel very home at. It's called the cloud, because what do you do with this humongous amount of data which is now sensed? There is this logical place that we call the cloud where you can store all of this data and compute on top of it. And you're saying, okay, what's, the, what's new about that one? We have always had the possibility of building our own data centers. And again, it's the story we tell and you all tell as our customers and partners that nowadays, again, the advent of the internet revolution led to that today, in less than a few minutes, you can spin out more resources and get storage that in the past only really big multinationals would have access to. So this is two of the main constituents, but again, coming back to the value, so what? What do I do with this? And going to the right side 
of my three pillars. Um, for the lack of a better word, and maybe you have better ones than we, so please come afterwards and tell me, we talk about the intelligence space. Because all this data is just raw data. I mean, what we need to do first is to get the information out of the data. And when I went to school, we had things like information theory and statistical analysis. Today, we use more fancy terms called analytics, inferencing. And of course, there's advances in things like machine learning. But at the end of the day, what we try to do is to get insights out of the data. And once we have the insights, then we have to apply domain knowledge because you want to solve some problems. And the most technical term to describe domain knowledge is logic or business logic. So once you combine these insights with the business logic, then I, you have to take action. And the moment you combine this, then we can talk about intelligence, because just the knowledge without action is almost useless. So that are the three constituents, things, the cloud, and intelligence, and looking at that, I actually like the abbreviation IUT. The only thing which I would propose is use the letters for something else. Use I for intelligence. Take the O, chop it in half. The left side is cloud. The O is orchestration, cloud orchestration. And T stands for things. So intelligence, cloud orchestration, and things. And cloud orchestration is essential because it simplifies the complexity of IoT solutions. And a year ago, at this very same place, um, we started in the cloud, of course, naturally, AWS, we started in the cloud, and we were announcing our AWS IoT service. The AWS IoT service that we announced a year ago is essentially a platform that enables you to do four major things. A, it allows you to securely connect devices to AWS services and other things. B, it allows you to, um, to process and uh, to act upon the data that these things actually generate. Thirdly, what it also allows is enables application to interact with those things, whether they're online or offline. And last but not least, it fully integrates with other AWS services so that you can reason on top of the data. And during the process of the year, we also added a few more capabilities to this. I mean, we had IPv6 support and web sockets or SDKs for Android and, uh, and uh, uh, iOS. But what I wanted to do today is to focus a little bit more on the left side, on the thing side. So from the starting point of the cloud, going to the thing side, which you typically denote also the edge. And I'm very happy and pleased to announce something which most of you most likely have already seen at Andy's keynote, the introduction of a brand new AWS service called AWS Greengrass. And AWS Greengrass allows you now to do four things. It allows you to locally execute logic. It allows you to have local messaging on devices. and allows you to store and sync data in a very secure way. And when you look at this, then you're saying, OK, the most important thing about Greengrass is it allows you to do so locally even when the internet connectivity is lost, if you don't have access to AWS or AWS IoT. And when you look at the pictures and you saw what I had before on the cloud, I mean, it looks very similar. And that's on purpose, because what we tried to achieve here was to have the exact same programming model that you're used now in cloud-native new applications, which is trigger-based action, messages, which then can trigger Lambda functions, which then can more or less initiate any type of logic. And it's the exact same programming model that we have now on things. So developers can now go onto the cloud, develop their application, test them there, and with a push of a button in our console, deploy that logic at the edge. And again, why is that important? Why does it matter? I mean, there are many IoT applications and solutions which rely and actually need local compute. And there are principally three major reasons. One is physical limitations. I mean, we can't beat the speed of light. That means there is a round trip delay going from certain devices to the cloud and coming back. And if you have very sensitive applications, like, for example, emergency control, you want to stop a robot before it hits a wall, then, of course, you ideally do the compute locally. There are other cases where you have regulatory or privacy situations, even the law prohibiting you to send certain information across the cloud. Give an example like hospitals. You always have to store certain data locally at the hospitals where the data is generated. 
And last but not least, of course, there's always sometimes no internet connectivity available. Just think about a jet engine, which generates terabytes of data, which you, of course, no need locally. But you can't rely on internet, and sometimes there might be no internet. Or what if you're in a factory, and there were no internet connection, and your manufacturing would go down? So again, that's why we did it. And we worked very closely with our customers, who actually more or less asked us multiple times, AWS, could you please help us doing this? Because in the past, this was very difficult. We either needed to have embedded software experts who had to touch the devices in the field, program them. Then, of course, we could build our applications in the cloud, but it, in reality, didn't really work together. And now we have the exact same programming model so that you have execution in the cloud, on the devices, or hybrid seamlessly. And again, how does it do it? What does it do? Four things. Local execution via Lambda. Triggering via messages. All of that secure and access controlled, because that is very important in the end of things. And last but not least, state sync with the cloud. And how do you get it? Um, Greengrass is essentially a runtime, which can run on almost all devices, which run a multi-purpose processor. Um, we will start with releasing the Greengrass runtime on Linux, Ubuntu, and Amazon Linux. And we work with chipset suppliers, Intel, Qualcomm, and Anapurna Labs, who pre-integrate Greengrass into their base ports of their offerings. We also have Canonical distribute Greengrass via the Ubuntu Snap software app uh, store. So you can also download it on existing devices. Um, yeah, that's Greengrass in a nutshell and how you get access to it. And if you're interested and you would like to play with it, then please apply for the limited preview at aws.amazon.com slash Greengrass. And in order to give you some examples what problems you can solve with this, it's my pleasure to invite some of our launch customers and partners to the stage. And let's start with Gary Goodconnect from Technicolor, the world leader in home gateways. Gary, please welcome. Thank you, Dirk, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, share the reInvent stage uh, with you today. The relationship that Technicolor and Amazon is forging today is a joint commitment to open innovation and industry-wide collaboration that's important to both of our corporate cultures. For Technicolor, it's in keeping with our role as a better together company. Over the last 100 years, Technicolor has collaborated with content creators in film, episodic, advertising, animation, and gaming to create experiences that audiences love. We apply visual effects, sound, and color science to more than 70% of blockbusters around the world. As well, we partner with network service providers, whether telco, cable, or mobile, to improve consumer access to engaging content. Over a million Technicolor devices, whether set-top boxes or gateways, are installed into end consumers' houses each and every week. And thirdly, we also work with consumer device manufacturers to deploy technology to make sure that the content that audiences want to view is shown in a way that's consistent with the original artists. Now, Technicolor has long held the belief that the broadband gateway, which is at the edge of the, of the access network, in the linchpin location between the home and the internet, is the environment into which to launch new applications and services that are truly meaningful for end consumers. Consumers who are both bringing more and more devices onto their home networks and consuming more and more services on those devices. We have long suffered with this belief, looking for a meaningful application execution environment to bring onto our gateways. One that can bring together the right combination of technology, tools, and scale. Today, we're delighted to extend our collaboration with Amazon through Greengrass to deliver on a first realization of that belief, which is going to tap into a new dynamic, a new relationship that the cloud can now have with devices and consumers in the home. This bridge between cloud and edge technology will act as a force multiplier to create those and, and, and bring about those new services that uh, we've been imagining for years. 
Some of those are easily imaginable, uh, imaginable, such as using conversational voice to configure network settings or to troubleshoot broadband service issues in the home. Other services will take us by complete surprise and will likely disrupt the economic assumptions that we currently hold true to delivering broadband services into the home. What's exciting about the uh, direction that we're taking with, with Amazon through Greengrass is that there are a few concrete ways in which we can try to put our vision into action. First, by leveraging Amazon Web Services and Greengrass and the tools and the ecosystem that come with it to create those gateway applications, bearing in mind that Technicolor is the number one provider of broadband gateways to network service providers in the world. Secondly, by also looking to take advantage of those new opportunities that Amazon IoT and Greengrass are gonna uh, deliver to us. Third, by integrating the Alexa personal assistant into some of our Technicolor broadband gateways. And fourth, by incorporating Amazon's Alpine system on a chip into a new family of gateway products. Until now, the world of application development has fallen into hard silos. With this announcement around Greengrass, that will change. With Greengrass, Technicolor looks forward to bringing the same level of innovation to broadband gateways that we've come to expect from the cloud, creating a new canvas for thousands of developers around the world. For end users, being able to interact with these new services in simple and natural ways will increase consumer appetite for those services, thereby bringing additional opportunities for network service providers and application developers to increase their engagement with the end consumers. It all represents a massive opportunity for application developers to expand their footprints into the connected home. So we, Technicolor, together with Amazon, look forward to working with all of you to redefine what connectivity, entertainment, and digital life will look like as we approach the end of the decade. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. I don't know how it's about you, but I always have problems with my home router. And I just saw what these guys try to do, that it automatically fixes itself just using green grass. That would be awesome, especially for my wife when I'm not at home and I can configure it. But I don't know, most people, including myself, when I talk about the Internet of Things, for whatever reason, I think about these small, these very small things. And then I said, but there is also a different way. There's a complete different world outside. And it's my pleasure to have Jonathan Ballon, the vice president of IoT from Intel, coming on stage talking about some physically really, really big things. Jonathan, welcome. Thanks, Dirk. So I think it was almost 25 years ago in 1993 when Eric Schmidt, who was not a well-known individual at the time, he was CTO of Sun Microsystems, and he said famously and very prophetically, when the network is as fast as the processor, the computer hollows out and spreads across the network. So in 1993, effectively, Eric Schmidt was predicting the Internet of Things, this idea that the definition of the network itself is going to change, and it's going to include endpoints that span a variety of different categories. And we're going to talk about one example today, uh, which is mining. Uh, we talked, uh, Dirk said, we're going to talk about really big things. These trucks are really, really big. But to put it into context, I think it's important to understand this fallacy that has been pervasive since the beginning of the cloud about eight years ago, and this idea that all compute, storage, and networking is going to take place in the cloud, and therefore all the analytics and all of the value will take place in the cloud, thereby making all of the devices and machines at the edge dumb data sources. That is a fallacy. And if you haven't believed companies like Intel or you know, large industrial customers for the last eight years who have been telling you that no, in fact, uh, that is not the case. It's just been validated today at reInvent by Amazon. And I've been to many reInvents, and there is always phenomenal innovation that gets announced at these sessions. But I will tell you, Greengrass and the evolution of the cloud into a distributed end-to-end -end architecture is super profound. And I can't uh, overestimate how important uh, uh, these capabilities are. So let's get into it. Why is performance at the edge important? Well, when you're talking about 
uh, use cases, like in the industrial category, where you need real-time performance. And when I talk about real-time, we're talking about things measured in milliseconds, things that are highly regulated, things that may impact people's lives, things where precision and performance is paramount. You need that performance uh, happening at the edge as close to the source of that data or that machine as possible so that you can reduce the latency of the comms because you can't always move workloads or move data, particularly if it's rich data, back into the cloud for reasoning and then back to the device for action. It needs to take place locally. And there's great examples of this in machine learning, in computer vision. And now with the advent of AI and the ability to train and score deep learning algorithms, uh, it becomes even more uh, important. And of course, the ability to have security embedded on those machines at the edge, below the operating system, at the most secure part of the architecture, is critical. So now we have, uh, with Greengrass, an architecture that spans end to end, from the device through a fog computing uh, capability and all the way back uh, into the cloud. So what Intel and uh, AWS are doing together is really putting together a pre-configured set of capabilities that companies can deploy that integrates in with their existing systems in uh, either greenfield or brownfield uh, instances. Here's an example of one gateway. This is a gateway from Advantech that's running uh, uh, Intel processing capabilities, has full uh, comms enablement uh, from uh, Wi-Fi to Bluetooth to LTE. And it allows the ability for data to be transacted on locally or to be securely transacted and delivered to the cloud. Um, and it's super exciting. Let's take a look. So here's one of these big trucks that uh, Dirk was talking about. The wheels on these trucks cost $25,000 a piece. And each truck has six of them. And if you, you can't tell from the scale, but uh, if you see the, uh, if, a, if a human was to be standing up next to this truck, they wouldn't even be uh, halfway uh, up the size of the tire. And so there's a couple of aspects to this use case. One is they want to make sure that they're getting the most life out of these tires. And the roads that they drive on in these large mining operations are rough. And so the ability to map out these roads and be able to optimize the performance uh, of these trucks and their tires on these roads leads to huge savings in the replacement and utilization uh, of those tires. But it also plays a key role in the safety of the operators, because when those trucks are operating in rough terrain, uh, you can have uh, accidents. And so the ability to have sensors, and these are Intel-based MCU sensors that sit in each of the wheels, can real-time deliver information about how that truck is performing, the conditions of the road, deliver that back through that onboard uh, gateway that's running uh, a pre-integrated instance of green grass. So you can imagine in these remote locations where you don't have persistent connectivity, where you need real-time uh, analytics and performance, this is the perfect solution uh, for companies um, in mining and for other industries, uh, and you can imagine in healthcare, in oil and gas, and other things. So we're super excited about green grass. I hope uh, you are as well. And Dirk, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much. So we have seen two very diverse use cases. One more in the home with the things which we associate in and other things with, others with really, really big things. This time, we talk about the trucks. So that's what you can do. That's two type of problems you can solve when you know the state of things. And then you can reason on top of that, taking the edge and taking the cloud. But we not only stay in the cloud and at the edge. We, over the last year, did the work to make AWS IoT even smarter. And how did we do that? By just using, again, the power of AWS other services, like Amazon Machine Learning, for example. Amazon Machine Learning now integrates seamlessly with the rules engine of AWS IoT so that you can pass payloads to AML, Amazon Machine Learning, and get the predictions back. Again, that's what I was talking with the intelligence domain. There is much more new fancy technology available. Or we can use something like AWS Elasticsearch in Kibana. So what we can do there, you put the payloads to Elasticsearch for indexing or further search, and you can use the Kibana app addition to visualize everything. 
So that's just one part of how we made this a little bit smarter. On top of that, just as recently as last week, we launched a new dashboard capability. And to the right on the screen, so you can see these new dashboards. So that is part of our AWS console. So instead of that, you have to write your own visualization, which is one glance, it's very easy to see some of the most important operational parameters, like which message are sent, where are your things online, and which rules are executed directly in our console. And for those of you who already are familiar with AWS, you said, wait a minute, that looks a little bit different to the right. And you're right, because we not only launched the dashboard, we launched a complete new console last week to make it so much more easier to start with AWS IoT. So it's very simple for the first time usage to come to AWS IoT, to register a thing, to get the certificates, put it out, connect it, and have a first rule executed. So make it even easier and even faster. But IoT, you remember what I said in the beginning or when I showed this nice canonical analyst graph with the billions of things? It's not only about how do you connect one single device securely, but thousands, hundred thousands, millions or 10 millions of those. And we also innovated over the last year and had additional features like bring your own certificates or just-in-time registration, or jitter, if you want to abbreviate it, which made it, at the end, feasible to partners like what you have seen here on, this, uh, on the screen, microchip, to bring new solutions to the market in order to deploy many devices at scale. And in this case, microchip just put out a little solution. It's a crypto chip called ECC548, which more or less is tailor-made um, for a customer where you can have an on-the-chip securely generated keys with directly are mapped to the certificates which are pre-registered to an account. So when you then sell or build a lot of devices, instead of that you then, after sales and power on, you have to generate certificates and download on them devices, you just switch on the device and it works securely out of the box with AWS IoT. So it's also easier to deploy. But maybe the absolute easiest way to start with AWS IoT and have a complete solution is something completely different. And um, it's not something really new because we launched it last year. It is the AWS IoT button. The a What's the AWS IoT button? The AWS IoT button is a Wi-Fi enabled device that connects directly to AWS IoT. And with a click of a button, you can start a service in the cloud using Lambda functions. So it is actually very easy to start up a new deployment. And today we made this even easier because starting today you can download a, an application which has the very inventive name of AWS IoT button app. It's available for iOS and Android and it makes it even easier to register, configure, and even get Lambda function pre-configured as action on the app. So with a click of a finger, you can, for example, say, OK, send a certain number, an SMS when I click it, or send an email, and then go to the console afterwards and state it, or do it on the app. So get started in less than a minute, Amazon.com, order the button, 1995, and off you go. But we also listened to our first customers who bought the original button and said, wouldn't it be awesome if I could have more battery life? And we are pleased that we worked a little bit hard with our lab 126, which is doing our hardware. And they came up with a second version, a new version of the button, which will be available in February. But you can already pre-order the button today. But if you don't want to wait, again, no worries. Again, go to Amazon.com, order the original button. It is still available. And we throw even in $20 of AWS credits per AWS account. So you literally get the button for free. And Want more information? AWS, Amazon.com slash button. But it's not only for developers where we wanted to spur innovation. We were actually very humbled and surprised by the amount of interest that large corporations had in this button. And they said, hey, AWS, what about if we could use the button to create our own innovation? What if I could use the button and with a click, pizza is ordered? Or what if I could use the button that our customers with a click get a service um, provided to them, like in the home because something is broken, or a practitioner is calling you back when you click it because you might be sick. So we were thinking about this very hard, 
And today as well, we announced the limited preview for something what we call the Enterprise Button Program. And what does this mean? That means for an enterprise customer who has this great idea of a complete new solution, you can bulk order these AWS IoT buttons at scale. You can design your own logo and put it on that button. It comes pre-configured securely, and then it does everything you want with one click in the cloud. And we just put Home Advice and Ili Alilili as some of our partners. Um, and I'm very pleased to have Brian Pocorni from Miller Coors coming on the stage and talking about a very important problem for his customers. Brian. Thank you, Dirk. Well, I'm glad Dirk said it wasn't just for developers because I'm not a developer. I actually work in digital marketing. Um, at Miller Coors, everyone has the same job. It doesn't matter if you're in marketing, sales, accounting, a brewer, a truck driver, or the CEO, we all do the same thing. We sell beer. Good job, right? Uh, we know that beer is one of life's simple pleasures, and we work hard to be the, the first choice of our consumers. We want to delight them at every turn, and part of that is make it easier for them to get beer. Beer is a very unique category. For those of you who haven't worked in the category, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's heavy to carry. It's heavy to ship. It's usually consumed soon after you purchase it, and it's generally not purchased online yet. If you need diapers or a new shirt or batteries, you might think about looking online. If you need beer, th think about looking for your shoes, heading to the grocery store or the bodega or the convenience store. If you live in Chicago like I do, you grab your hat, three or four Amazon Web Services sweatshirts, and your boots too. And the beer selling system is actually very complicated. There's 50 states in the US with 50 different sets of laws and three tiers of distributors, retailers, I'm sorry, brewers, distributors, and retailers. It's very complicated, but guess what? Our consumers don't care about that at all. They're looking for what we call, in Millicores, frictionless shopping. And that's why we're working hard to make it easier for our legal drinking age consumers to get a beer in their hand through several testable areas. That is why we started looking at the connected home strategy, and where our group, the Millicores Digital Incubator, is really leaning into the potential of the Internet of Things and the new enterprise buttons that Dirk talked about. We worked with AWS and a third-party alcohol e-commerce partner called Drizzly to allow consumers to get beer when they want it, but more importantly, how they want it. The Dash program proved to us that people do want frictionless shopping. And Amazon has a separate pillar with the Echo that is a separate second pillar of our connected home strategy as well. As you know, more and more consumers are ordering or reordering consumer goods with a push of a button or their voice. And that's what we worked on with AWS to make beer part of this consideration set. I mean, think about it. There's a football game on tonight. You have a bunch of guys coming over, guys and girls coming over. You look in the fridge, there's one beer left. Just reach up to your fridge, hit the button. It looks a lot like that one, not like this one. An hour later, it's Miller time. When it came to assessing our infrastructure partner options for this test, AWS was obviously our choice. First of all, the fact that the buttons don't need to be connected to another device via Bluetooth or another, pr another protocol made it a clear differentiator. It was very important to us that the button could be a standalone device in the kitchen for our consumers. We also really appreciated that the full suite of AWS solutions was all accessible in one place. It made integration a dream. We're launching both an IoT button and Alexa Pilot at the same time, so having the products like Lambda, EC2, and DynamoDB together in that system were very important at least to my team. And it really helped our team that the AWS team was there to help at every turn. So our pilot program is, is launching with Drizzly imminently. We are really looking forward to working with their open API and growing footprint and the AWS tools that I mentioned to really delight the consumers that we have. This is the solution that we were looking for for the last two years in our group, the Millicores Digital Incubator. And to be honest, we're very excited to see it launch in the next, in the next week. And this is also fully within the legalities of the three-tier system I mentioned earlier. So please keep your eyes peeled. At Miller Coors and Molson Coors, we're always looking for innovative solutions and ways to delight our beer drinkers. So if you have any ideas, please grab me. Let's head talk over a beer. Cheers. Thank you so much. So, and as you see, we also try to solve some really important problems. And that's where I come back to where I started. What is? the real value of IoT is solving 
these problems. And because it is so important, I, I can't stop here. I, we just have to have a few more examples of what important problems we can solve. And it's really my pleasure to welcome Dale Wiggins from Philips on stage, and he will show us how he makes our lives hopefully a little bit more healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dirk. Now that uh, we're all on a high, because I got my own personal nirvana of beer on demand, and I can already think about how I can get chicken wild wings on, on demand as well, I got to kind of bring you down a little bit. Sorry to do that, but I, I got to try to make it real to start out. So, do a little exercise. Look left, look right. One out of the three of you are going to have cancer in your lifetime. That sucks. It's rather sobering. <laughs> Sorry. 500 million of us are going to have respiratory disease, some we have to live with. 400 million of us are going to have diabetes. And with beer on demand, I hate to tell you, it's probably going to get worse. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. Moderation, right? And how many of you just went through your open enrollment process for your health care and saw your health insurance premiums go down? All right, probably at zero hands on that one. So it's unsustainable. Cost is unsustainable. Fortunately, Healthcare providers aren't standing still. They're trying to do something about that. Does it help if I click some buttons? Um, so what are they doing? So first of all, one of the things that, you know, I think you've all experienced, you go to the doctor, they get reimbursed for a uh, procedure, pay for service. They're rethinking the way the care is delivered, focusing on the value, focusing on the end outcome. And I think that's really key. The other thing that they're doing is they're figuring out ways to shift care from expensive environments like hospitals into the home. I read something the other day where one of the largest providers in the United States last year for the first time had more encounters with their patients outside the hospital through telehealth than they did in their traditional settings. The other thing that they're doing is they're allowing people like you and me to engage in healthy living. How do we stay healthy? How do we stay out of the hospital? So how does IoT play into this? Well, I'm sure you know, many of us have, have these devices, wearing them today. I read 84 million of these things were sold last year. Gardner's projecting like 500 million by 2020. Sounds like a pretty good market for IoT. But what are you actually going to do with that data? And I think that's where we really need to focus and a lot of companies are really focusing on today. How do you make, how do you pull that information together? How do you associate it with an individual? How do you put it into context? How do you secure it so that it's only used for the things that I want it to be used for? That's what it's all about. How do you make it actionable? So let me talk about some of the things we're doing within Philips. So oral health care. That's actually a very important thing to focus on. You can look it up for yourself. But one of the things that we launched this year was a new connected Sonicare toothbrush. Sonicare was a great toothbrush. It still is, but it's even better now with connectivity. So you can actually hook it up, hook it up to your, your app, you can see how effective you are in terms of your brushing. We actually have sensors in the brush head themselves. And so you can actually see that in real time as you're brushing your teeth. But then you can also share that information when you go to your dental professional, your hygienist. So you can actually have a more meaningful visit with your hygienist in terms of how you can actually improve your oral health care going forward. Another example is I'm sure many of you are parents, I am, that when you first come home with that baby, you have no clue what you're going to do. It's a pretty scary experience if you haven't gone through it yourself. So we've come up with an app called YouGrow. And the whole intent of YouGrow 
is it's a program to help you during that first thousand days of your child's life. It connects with things like um, a smart monitor, a smart baby monitor, a smart thermometer, hue light bulbs, uh, a weight scale, et cetera. And then it puts that information together in context about you and your child to really help you care for your child during those critical early stages. But then also you can bring that information with you when you visit your care provider, your pediatrician, so that they can actually be a participant in that full life cycle. Another, another application is what we call our dream family. So 100 million people have what they call obstruct, obstetric, or no, obstructive sleep apnea. A lot of people think it's just snoring. It's actually, you're actually, in a non-medical term, stopping breathing for a very short period of time. So there's a device called a, called a positive airway pressure machine that actually helps you through that, and it dramatically improves your, your care. I have a family member that suffered migraines for years, couldn't figure it out. Ultimately, he had this condition. Since he started using this machine, his quality of life has just dramatically improved. His work, you know, you can think about the productivity improvements. So we have this full suite of applications that help them engage with that so that ultimately the effectiveness is improved. And we've seen basically engagement and improvement going from 50 to 75 percent. So it's also important that we don't forget about our traditional healthcare settings in the hospital. At, uh, in Chicago this week is the Radiology Society North America show. Thank you, Dirk, for kidding, putting me in Las Vegas this week instead of Chicago. But one of the things we announced there is, is a suite of applications called Performance Bridge. And it's all about how do you get a, or how do you enable a radiology department to run more effectively. And that's all enabled by IoT. So why is that important for Philips? We have around 300,000 big imaging modalities across the world in 100 different countries. And when you add in all our patient monitors, all our other smaller devices, you've got millions of devices the hospitals count on to run effectively to deliver care for their patients. So that's where we use IoT. And one of the applications that we provide or in, in Performance Bridge is predictive analytics tied in through IoT to ensure that that MRI machine that you just spent a million dollars on is always running so that, number one, they can collect revenue for those procedures, but even more importantly, you don't have to reschedule a pay, uh, procedure if you are a patient, which can be a very nerve-wracking experience. So lastly, as we looked across the solutions that we need to provide in in-hospital environment, not all of them can be cloud-enabled or completely cloud-enabled. We really needed a hybrid solution. So that's why we're really excited to be working with Amazon on the Greengrass program so that, you know, those three things that, that Dirk mentioned, you know, uh, network disconnects, low latency, privacy, we can all address, address them through the Greengrass uh, program. And that's really something that held us back in a lot of cases before from going completely to the cloud. So hopefully I gave you some insight into what we're doing in healthcare, and hopefully that gives you some uh, clues into how you might use it in your domain as well. Thank you so much. Go, let's go. Okay. This is a presentation about the Internet of Things. And now I need all of your help. It's the last thing we'll do. And it, now it sounds a little crazy, but just pretend for a while that you're in an airplane. That means it would be great if you take your mobile devices and put them in airplane mode. And if you have a laptop, which most of you most likely have on your knees anyway, you don't have them to put them under the seat in front of you, but please switch off Wi-Fi. It is very important because what we will show you now requires that we don't have disturbances in the electromagnetic fields. Because, as I said, it's a presentation about the Internet of Things, so we have one more 
thing for you. And I'm very pleased to have Tom Soderstrom and Mike Cox from JPL here on stage to introduce you to that thing, and that thing is called Rovi. Thank you very much. Uh, so, at JPL and NASA, we look for answers to the big questions, the, the weighty ones, uh, that affects all of humanity. Is there life on Mars? Is there life in space? If an asteroid was to get close to us, could we redirect it? Could we find Earth 2.0? So all of those questions uh, are weighty, but it's a playfulness to try to answer them. And what we're finding is with AWS, we have new ways of getting the answers. It's the infrastructure of immense computing. Sometimes we use hundreds of thousands of processors. It's the internet of things for complete situational awareness. And it's a new set of collaborators. It's all of you. And you give us new ways of working. It's also the schools, the next generation. So what we want to do is introduce you to our robotic ambassador. And as most things start with a playfulness, uh, this uh, robot is kind of fun. We're known for the rovers on Mars. And now you're going to see a little prototype. But as we send this to uh, universities, to high schools, to middle schools, consumer technology is really important. So this is all built with open source components. Uh, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, open software, and of course AWS, IoT, Lambda, and the newly announced Lex, and of course Greengrass. So uh, one of these folks is a robot, the other one is Mick Cox, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we simulated the environment on Mars, it's about as cold there as it is here, so uh, warm us up, Mick. <laughs> thanks, Tom. <clears throat> so thanks, Tom, and thanks, Dirk. Um, my name is Mick, but more importantly than that, this is Rovi. Uh, at JPL, we're always playing with the new technology that's coming out, including what AWS is coming out with. And we're very excited about some of the announcements that were um, actually made public this morning, uh, especially AWS Greengrass, um, of course, the Alexa suite, and specifically Amazon Lex. So with some of those new technologies, we've actually been able to teach Rovi to do things that she's never been able to do before. So today, you can ask questions to Rovi, and she'll give you answers about Mars. Rovi? Rovi? How big is Mars? I have a lot of answers that might relate to Rovi? that. Try asking me a different Rovi? question. How big is Mars? Mars is about half the size of Earth. Its land area is about that of all of Earth's continents put together. Rovi? If you what is the radius of Mars? The average radius, distance from its center to its surface, of Mars is 2,107 miles, 3,390 kilometers. How about that? Um, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> so she's getting questions from a database that we have that we've been collecting and, and, and creating and curating. Um, in addition, you can ask her what the actual rover did today on Mars, and she'll give you um, up-to-the-day updates as to what's actually happening on Mars through this. Um, in addition to asking Rovi that, we announced yesterday in Tom's talk with James Hamilton last night um, that NASA and JPL have come out with a NASA Mars application for Alexa, the skill as well. So if you want to go home and check out the NASA Mars Alexa application, you can get all of that information um, directly to your living room as well. But Rovi does more than just answering questions. You can also give her drive commands. Rovi, follow me. Following. So now what's happening is there's a 3D sensor on her front that is watching where I am and is publishing messages to AWS IoT. The head and the wheels are subscribing to both of those uh, messages that are happening. And so then you see the wheels go. And in addition, I have a laptop over here, which is subscribed to the messages in the cloud. We'll back her up just a little bit. And you can see on the UI there um, that it's updating in real time as to what's happening on the rover. So I'm going to walk away from this just for a moment. Now you can imagine, if this rover were to lose internet connectivity with the AWS IoT setup, it would cease to work. Now I'm telling you today that all of the devices here are connected to the internet through this router, and this you know, very non-obscure uh, cord is the connection to the public internet. So I'm actually going to rip that cord out, 
and I promise that Rovi does not have connectivity to the public internet right now, you'd imagine that it might stop working, but thanks to the power of Greengrass and AWS Greengrass, that's no longer the case. Uh, the messages are still being picked up by the sensor. They're still being uh, um, you know, pushed out locally to the Greengrass core, and then the Greengrass Aware devices, which are the wheels and the head, um, are reacting to those devices. So now you won't see anything update on the UI because it's not going out to the public cloud. So that's expected. So we'll drive her around just a little bit more, have her stop, <clears throat> and I'll walk, walk back over here. But that's not where it stops, right? We want to have access to all of those data um, that were collected while she's offline. So what I'm actually going to do is take the public internet and give it back to Rovi. So it'll take a couple seconds for the router to reconnect to the outside internet. And then once that happens, it'll take a couple seconds for all the devices on Rovi to reconnect here. And then as soon as that all happens, you'll actually see the path that she drove while she was offline update in the UI. And there it is. So you can imagine this is a big deal for us at JPL, as it will be for other enterprises as well. This is going to open up a ton of new use cases for us, both on Earth and on other planets as well. Um, so now you've had sort of a, a very you know, simple um, introduction to Rovi. If you want to learn a little bit more um, deeper information about some of the building blocks that we use to build this, specifically um, AWS Greengrass, we'll talk about that in IoT 304, a breakout session later today and again in an overflow session tomorrow. Um, and then if you want to know about the voice connectivity and the component that's actually built on Amazon Lex, you can come see us in MAC 304 today. And with that, I'll hand it back over. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Absolutely. Pleasure. Thanks. So with that, we are almost done. I just want to inform you, oh, now it's still following you. What do we do? Not that it falls down. Step, Rovi. Um, we have. We now start, actually, the entire afternoon here in the Mirage, the IoT Mini Conference. We have three tracks, one related to devices and services. You want to know the details about how the heck does Greengrass really work. You want to see it. You want to have some technical discussion. You want to learn more about the buttons and the SDKs. That's the track you want to be in. When you want to understand much more about our cloud platform, the AWS IoT service, then we have that as well with a lot of customers going in and presentation how that works. And of course, the IoT solutions is mainly about customers and partners on stage and telling you more about which problem do they solve and which difficulties did they encounter. And then we have also two workshops where you can get your hands dirty. And with that, again, I thank all of the six speakers on stage particularly also Rovi, and I wish you all a great continuation of reInvent. Thank you very much, and don't forget your evaluation. Thank you so much. <laughs>